Father, thank you for the scriptures where you speak to your church authoritatively and inerrantly. Thank you even for the gift of song that you've given your people that we could respond in exalting you, putting you on display before a watching world. Our worship is all about you, not about us. Will we sing about what you've accomplished for the praise of your great name and saving sinners and giving us the mercy of ministry? What grace upon grace you've bestowed upon us. And so, Lord, as we study your word, help us to understand it well and to apply it consistently in the days ahead, should Jesus tarry. And we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, if you would take your Bibles and join me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to preach to a sermon that I've entitled, Cultivating Missionary Love in Prayer. Cultivating Missionary Love in Prayer. Because many of us can't reach the mission field on our feet. I think you've heard me reflect before in recent days or sometimes since we've been together in the last couple of years that it took 20 years, over 20 years, before God delivered a dream to me where I could go to the mission field even though I'd surrendered to it two decades before. And a couple of years, three years ago, it was an amazing opportunity. So many of us can't get there on our feet, but we can get there on our knees. And that's a perspective I want us to understand and implement in our church life together. When Jesus gives his final words to the church in Matthew's gospel, there is the Great Commission, where in Matthew 28, 19, he commissions all of his followers to go. And while you are going about, so we gather for worship in the house of worship when we scatter for evangelism. And so evangelism takes on that local aspect in our lives, working and going to the market and our neighborhoods and those that we have a sphere of influence with. And, and since we, many of us can't go to the nations, we send others on our behalf to carry on the, the work of the church. So Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, we are privileged here in America. You know, when I was down in Honduras and all Latin American pastors were there getting trained for 30 hours of lectures and the seminary, Sepe Seminary, is trying to just add to their library and I look at my library and it's bigger than the seminary library and trying to find people. You know, there's this pastor in Uganda that I've been uh, working with and just working on getting him. He saw me post on social media some biblical counseling booklets I use all the time with counseling people. It's like, can I get me some of those? It's like, hey, brother, we'll do what we can to get you some of these resources because we are spoiled rotten. According to the world's standards, we are rich even though it, we live paycheck to paycheck at times. So, when it comes to missions, who's the greatest missionary? You know, in our contemporary church in our generation, one of the greatest known missionaries may be Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, who went to the Aka Indians and uh, Elizabeth Elliot, after her husband had been slaughtered, been a martyr for the gospel, carried on a radio ministry many of you have benefited from. Jim Elliot died in January 8th. 1956, in Operation Aka, an evangelistic campaign for the Harani people of Ecuador. He and his wife, in their 20s, said, we're going. Just like Isaiah, here am I, send me. Five men that day died in the river, speared by those that they went to preach the good news to. Nate Saint. Ed McCulley, Peter Fleming, Roger Yadurian, and Jim Elliott. And since the context of our life and where we live is in the liberal state of Oregon, and we can get very jaded, especially during political times, thinking that nothing good can come out of Portland, that's where Jim Elliott was born. And so something good can come out of that liberal city, and he went to Bible college, and he died at the ripe old age of 28 years old in cause of the king. Jim Elliott 
said, He is no fool who gives up when he ca- what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. It's just a life. It's just money. It's just time. And yet when it's invested into the Master's hands for kingdom business, little is great when God is in it. What about those that He's not called to go, but to stay and to support? And what if it be us who don't have a whole lot of money? How can we be used in the extension of global evangelism through missions? Again, let me ask you another question uh, about the greatest missionary. So, uh, in our modern age of missions, Jim Elliot's name would be well known. But how about in biblical history? Can I submit to you that the Apostle Paul was probably the greatest missionary that has ever lived and it's been inscripturated in, in the Bible? I've probably given you long enough to get to 1 Thessalonians 5. It's the last chapter of the first epistle Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just one verse. One of the shortest verses. Brethren, pray for us. Verse 25, three words in our English. Brethren, pray for us. Now, as you think about Paul's credentials, he's got his resume to to submit to the uh, missions agency, right? Uh, Paul is bicultural, Jewish and Roman. Probably trilingual, Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Fluent in them. Paul's very biblical. You say, how so? Well, he penned much of the New Testament. Uh, I'd call that rather biblical. Out of 27 books of the New Testament, he wrote 13 of them, at least 13 of them. So he's bicultural, trilingual, very biblical. He's single. Now, that's, that's crucial in missions too. Uh, low cost. It doesn't cost a lot to send one guy to represent the good news of Jesus. When you've got a wife and kids and everything else, then the travel fair costs a whole whole lot more. You know, you can't imagine how much it costs to send out missionaries today with entire families. He's single. He's also a tent maker, self-supported. I got all my funds. I don't have to come up with that 80 to 100% support level. I'll take care of myself because it's not about the money. I just want to go preach the good news and be unhindered in doing that. He's hyper-motivated a natural leader, a preacher, a teacher, an evangelist, a church planter, and I submit to you one of the greatest models of missions for the modern church to implement. Here's a man who willingly suffered, who's unmoved, who's committed, dedicated, mobilized, bold, fearless, and not to mention a writer, a pastor, and an author. And yet... He penned an amazing verse, a short verse, a pregnant verse, if you will. Amazing because though he's gifted exponentially, he was still just a man. A man with great needs, just like you and I. This verse, brethren pray for us, is in a lot of, you know, I grew up in the church. I've seen it on a lot of missionary prayer cards. You look in your missionary eyeball to eyeball during your devotions and you're praying for their sphere of influence, their ministry, and their life verse for missions is this verse. Brethren, pray for us. So let's think through this verse before we cross-reference and go to some other passages that will continue to unpack what we want to look at this morning on prayer. He starts off the verse with brethren. Who's he asking to pray for him? The brethren. He's not expecting anything from the world. It's a term generally meaning Christians, but here it's specifically addressed to the believers at the church of Thessalonica. Brethren in that day, or their brethren in that they all share the same spiritual father. They're part of the same family. Doesn't matter what church he goes to for support. Their, their brethren. The amazing thing is that the great apostle Paul asked these young converts to intercede on his behalf. And so he urges, he requests prayer. 
That word is prosukamai. It's a verb that means to speak to or make requests to God. It's the most common word in the New Testament for prayer. The word embraces all that's included in the idea of prayer, whether it's the element of thanksgiving to God, requesting special things from God for yourself, requesting His blessings upon others as we intercede for them at the throne of grace. This is ongoing and a growing habit of true believers. They are people of prayer. We are dependent upon God. We, we need a lot. We are needy people. The same word is used earlier in the chapter in verse number 17, where in verse 16 he said, Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Another three-word English translation Pray without ceasing. And when he, when he urges them to pray without ceasing, it's not 24-7, as if we're always on our knees, but regular, persistent prayer to God. You know, and since I, uh, my copier went on the fritz and I didn't get this illustration in here, uh, I'll just have to recall to you. Several weeks ago, our bulletin insert was on the Civil War General Stonewall Jackson. I don't know if any of you read that. But he had some of his recruits who had said, what's it look like to pray without ceasing? And Stonewall says, you know, that when he uh, sits down to eat, that's grace. You don't dare partake of what God has benefited you with without thanking him first and foremost. And when he gets a letter he prays as he's opening for that his heart is prepared for whatever news is in that letter. And he goes on and on, which uh, again, the illustration would have been better if it had been in my notes. Persistent prayer, regular prayer of believers. So that when you go by an accident on the five on the way to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, you don't know the person, but you, what, you, you pray for them in whatever situation the gospel, gospel hope would be brought to them. And sometimes pull over and help them yourself and be the answer to your own prayers. Sometimes it's those 911 prayers. We don't know what to say. It's like, Lord, help. So, brethren, pray. Pray for us. Who's the us? Well, in the very first chapter of the epistle, in the first verse, it's identified as Paul and Silas and Timothy. It's the whole missionary team. Present tense shows that Paul didn't want this to be a once-for-all thing. You know how often we, you know, we talk with, we fellowship with each other like we're going to do at fellowship dinner today, and we share a need, and we say, hey, I'll pray for you. Well, maybe we ought to get in the habit of right then praying, so at least when we forget about it, we've done at least once. But so often, out of sight's out of mind if we don't have a prayer list to remind us through the week of what to be petitioned in heaven for. Make it a habit. Praying for our needs, praying for the ministry's team. Let me give you a little context for the verse. As you might remember, Paul, Silas, and Timothy first went to Thessalonica on their second missionary journey. Our scripture reading was in Acts 17. Let's, let's turn back there for just a moment. We're not going to reread all that we read together earlier. But in Acts 17 is the second missionary journey of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. It's actually the second place in Europe where the gospel had been preached. Thessalonica wasn't the first. Philippi was the first, according to Acts 16. But then when you get into Acts 17, notice the first few verses. Acts 17.1. When they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and that's where Paul, Paul always made a beeline. He'd get to a new city, he's going to the synagogue. People are already congregating there. It's not just a place for religious transactions, but social transactions. And so this is where I'm going to find people to talk about Jesus. Verse 2, according to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and given evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. 
And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. You know, throughout Acts, you can chase how when the, when the good news is preached, the church grows. People are getting saved, they get baptized, they join the church. You go to a new location where people haven't heard of Jesus and you preach the good news of Jesus. People get saved, they get baptized, they join the church. And you start planting biblically healthy churches to every nation. Now the gospel had been received so enthusiastically in Thessalonica that the synagogue had pretty much been depleted of Jews. So the authorities blamed Jason, a Jew who had lodged the missionaries of harboring traitors to Caesar. Jason was held as security while the missionaries left the city. And so after uh, this account in the beginning of chapter 17, then they go from Thessalonica to Berea in Athens. Well, he sends Timothy back to Thessalonica, according to chapter 3, first couple of verses, to encourage the believers and to get news from them. How are these new converts doing? Meanwhile, Paul travels to Corinth, where Timothy returns with good news about the church. You know, a lot of times you share the gospel with somebody, and it seems like they come to faith in Christ. There's repentance and faith, but we can't see the transaction. Where are they a few weeks later? Are they still in their, uh, their pothole of, of sin, or are they still in the body of Christ? Are they growing? And even though it's slow growth, is there still life there, or has it been a mirage of false life, false conversion? And so it was great. It was news to Paul's ear. Timothy comes back and says, we're doing well. So question, we need to ask, how old was the church in Thessalonica that Paul, who, who had this great resume for, for his missions work, asked for prayer? Acts 17 tells us that Paul only spent three Sabbaths in the synagogue of Thessalonica reasoning with the Jews. Some feel that that's all he spent there. Three weeks only. Others feel he must have spent longer than three weeks there outside the synagogue and of the Jewish community since the church was comprised mostly of Gentiles. Regardless, it can be affirmed quite convincingly that Paul didn't stay there very long, whether a few weeks or a few months at most. What can be said with absolute certainty is that this church is young, on the outside, if we're thinking graciously, maybe six months. On the outer extreme, six months old in Jesus. New converts, every one of them. And Paul asks for prayer support. That's interesting. Paul asked this young church of a few months to pray for him. For this humble slave of Christ Jesus, I'll take the support wherever I can get it. You're going to pray for me, you can never do me a more kindly thing in life than to pray for me. Give me a little time on your knees. Paul didn't see any spiritual superiority. He had known the Lord for a long time now. Shouldn't it have been the other way around? Humanly speaking, don't we expect the mature believers to pray for the young believers in the Lord? Should not Paul be praying for them? Well, he did. You go back to the first chapter, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2 and 3. In his opening remarks, he says in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. You know, there's kinship. You know, when people come to faith in Christ and they're, they're some of the fruit of your labors and the ministry, there's a depth of family life, gospel enterprise. These are our people. But Paul asked these new converts to also pray for him. It's a two-way street. But why? Why does he ask his young Christian friends to pray for him? I'll tell you why. Just read through the book of Acts during your devotions this week. You'll see that Paul, the mighty evangelistic machine, was constantly attacked. 
God already told you that Jason was held hostage while they got out of town. Folks, it's amazing to see how often and how violently Paul is attacked, verbally, spiritually, and physically for proclaiming the gospel. The ministry, if it's going to be a faithful ministry of the gospel, is not a safe place. Because many times it's not the unbelievers on the outside that just are putting up with you, your craziness, and your crutch of religion. It's usually people inside the church house, the religious people who, when you expose the, the sham of religion for not being the reality, that the, the fangs come out. Paul was always experiencing that. He's attacked verbally, spiritually, physically. He knew full well, full well, better than most, that being a missionary and trying to penetrate enemy territory with the saving gospel of Jesus is outright war with the enemy. Some of you know that, that have, have traveled to foreign countries, especially those with cults and whatnot, and it's, it's almost like it's in the air. You can almost cut it with a knife, the oppression that is there, that is manifests itself physically, even though it's a spiritual war. Not a safe place to be. Remember what Jesus said to Peter back in Matthew 16, 18, about the battle we're in? Peter had just made the confession, Thou art the Christ. And upon that confession that Jesus is the Christ, He is the coming Messiah that they had waited for, Jesus said, on that confession, I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Luke twenty two thirty one. Jesus says to Peter in particular, but I think it applied to all the disciples, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. Clearly it embraced all the disciples. That's why Peter would pen, in 1 Peter 5, 8, that your adversary the devil is prowling about, seeking whom he can devour. He's the prince in the power of the air. You know, he's, God's allowing him during this present dispensation to run rampant as the prince in power of the air. Uh, thankfully, Luther reminds us that even the devil is God's devil. God's got him on a leash, but at times that leash seems very long. And as he's uh, dividing and he came to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus said. Friends, this is the bottom line. Death and hell are the ultimate weapon of Satan to destroy us. He's on an all-out brutal war against the church of Jesus Christ and though we in, in Christ are guaranteed ultimate victory, we are not spared the battle in which he's pledged to drag as many unbelievers with him. And Satan would also like to cause as much defeat and division in the body of Christ as he can possibly do. That's what he does. He is the adversary, the opposer, outside the church, inside the church. In fact, no man can survive the battle of snatching souls from the hand of the enemy without being upheld by an army of, army of intercessory saints. That'd be suicide. You're looking as a missionary going out to the foreign field in enemy territory to be chewed up and spit out. Go back to Paul's epistle to the church at Ephesus for a moment. As he ends... His epistle in Ephesians 6. He talks about what this battle looks like and, and how we can successfully fight it. Notice it in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. He's bringing some, some more applicational and implication conclusion to what he's been teaching them. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Notice whose might? His, not ours. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. As dark and bleak as it may be in a sinful, broken world, a cursed world, God still expects us to stand. In his strength, not our own. Realize it's a spiritual battle, not a physical one, though it looks very physical. 
verses 13 to 17, he urges them to put on the armor of God and again repeats that you stand. Second time he mentions it. And when he wraps it up in a nice pretty package in verse 14, he says, stand therefore. We are not to fall for the enemy because we stand in Christ in His power, not our own. And after we have put on the full armor of God, because there are a lot of spiritual streakers in the Christian life, aren't there, that have not rolled themselves for a spiritual battle every day. That's why we need our daily devotions. Verse 18, he says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. We are not being alert and sober if we're slumbering outside of prayer, like the disciples in Gethsemane with Jesus. They snoozed during the prayer meeting. If you look at all of Paul's various requests for prayer, you can basically boil them down to four specific ones. And that's what we want to do. Uh, we want to finish our time by looking at these four Ones that become a good biblical guide for us to follow in 2022. Now, I don't usually alliterate my sermonic points, but maybe you'd jot them down and keep in your Bible or buy your missionary prayer list and use them as prayer points to deepen your love for our missionaries and enhance their effectiveness and our effectiveness through them. Work with them in prayer. The reformer Luther said that prayer is the sweat of the soul. So be willing to labor and sweat with our those that help us take the gospel to the nations. The first one would be power. Now go back to uh, we were in First Thessalonians. Go to go to his second epistle to the church at Thessalonica. Second Thessalonians, chapter three. This is one summary of Paul's prayer requests. And it's that he might be powerful in proclamation of the word of the living God. Second Thessalonians 3 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. There's that, you know, this is First Thessalonians 5.25 all over again. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. Here you've got new converts that the mature Apostle Paul had asked them for, for prayer. And in the same way that you guys experience the good news of the gospel and the power of Christ in your life, pray that that would be the same success and the power in the rest of my ministry to these other cities that I go to. Pray for power. That the word would spread rapidly. That verb is trexo. Literally, moving forward rapidly is that verb. Rush forward. Pray that the gospel will run forward. Isn't that a neat image that uh, Paul gives us in this word image? The gospel is running, that it might speed, speed rapidly. You know, we hear so many sour stories, and uh, isn't it great to hear when people are getting converted and hear testimonies of salvation? It's, um, the word is going forth, it's running forth. God's still saving sinners. Pray that that word would spread rapidly and be glorified, praised, honored, exalted. When we take the word of God to other people, I don't care if it's believers in the church or unbelievers outside the church, we want to teach the Bible with precision. We want to be good workmen who cut the word straight, diligent workmen who don't need to be ashamed because we're rightly dividing the word of truth. If we're saying, thus saith the Lord, it better be indeed something God has said. We don't want to put words in His mouth. So let's learn how to study the Scriptures and teach it with precision, cutting it straight. Well, at the time of the writing, Paul's in Corinth, where he's having a hard time convincing them to come to Christ. Acts 18, 4-8. He says they, they resisted and blasphemed, verse 6. As we were looking at in our Bible study probably two Wednesday nights ago, God's work done God's way instead of man's way. What can sinful man do to figure out ministry? Nothing. There's nothing we can figure out within us of how to strategize through our, our sinfulness to accomplish God's work. We've got to do it God's way as He's written it out in the 
blueprint of Scripture. Only the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, can subdue sinfully rebellious man. Don't take a butter knife out to do the work. Take the scalpel of the Word, which is living and active, and get down into the heart. So he's praying, asking for prayer for power, that the Word would spread, be glorified. And he says, just as it did with you. Paul's thinking back to the amazing ministry opportunity he had just experienced in Thessalonica. He saw a church planted there in perhaps less than a month or just a few months. Now he's writing a letter to the church only a few months after its birth, and he's asking them to pray the same thing would happen in Corinth and all the other places that he wanted to go plant churches. Now, beloved, fast forward several years to 2022. If you've read our missions philosophy and we've been able to have some, some coffee time about missions, you know that I, I personally believe that TMAI, the Masters Academy International, is the greatest mission story of our day. It is the single best strategy, not like the strategies I was raised in church understanding. Here you've got guys that are privileged in our country. Some of them had to, like I did, move from the northeast of central Maine doing ministry to the southwest to go to the Master Seminary and be trained in Bible exposition and sound doctrine. And so guys get to go to the Master Seminary and they end up listening to this guy on Grace to You called John MacArthur. Who's he? It's like, hey, would you send us people who would do that same sort of thing? And these are pastors in their churches saying, I don't know how to do this. I was in ministry for a dozen years listening to this guy and reading his commentary saying, how does he do this? I don't have the tools for this. But I had access to it. My family and I had to move cross country. So, in some of these countries, there are 17 training centers in key countries and others getting started all the time. Some of our missionary friends, the Moraleses that are right from Medford here and have been with us on Wednesday night and they're on our, their presentations on our YouTube channel. They're down in Colombia where Ricardo was born. And as he partners with other churches, there'll be another training center started down there in Colombia. This is exciting days in the world of missions. This is the best kept secret. Let's get it out. Training national pastors who don't have access to the tools and resources we do in training sound doctrine, training how to do biblical counseling and soul care, how to do expository preaching, which is the only biblical means of preaching. Reaching entire people groups and countries through that model. Pray the same thing for our missionaries. The very same thing. Pray for power. That the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified. Pray that God would drop the most amazing evangelistic opportunities in their and our laps. And that that would be repeated oftenly. You know, we're not in the birthing room often enough speaking about the gospel. You know, we want to see people converted and uh, get wet in believers' baptism and go to church. So pray for that. And that there'd be fruit, much fruit, rapid fruit, lasting fruit, praying fruit. Go back to Colossians, if you would. I think included in this praying for power is some of the terminology Paul would use is for open doors to speak. Now, I know that might sound kind of mystical, so let's uh, understand it biblically here. In Colossians 4, in verse number 2, he says, Devote yourselves to prayer. Okay, we got that. Keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Okay, we're supposed to be thankful in our prayers. Verse 3, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. You know, Paul's a jailbird for Jesus. You know, some of our gospel ministers on this continent on the borders north of us didn't know that the prayers of the saints for faithful ministry would take them to jail and gave them great gospel opportunity. And they didn't waver. 
In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9, he defines these open doors, our evangelistic doors of our opportunity. And there may be a lot of adversaries. As we continue to pray for gospel enterprise, one of the training centers is over in Ukraine. And in our limited sinful wisdom, who would have written the script that the way to get the gospel out throughout Europe was to take the most healthy missionary sending enterprise over there, which is Ukraine, and send the Russians in through war to scatter the believers. I wouldn't have written that script, but God did. And the church is rising to the standard. All these men that have been to Grace Bible Training Seminary are out doing ministry. They're rendering aid to those in need and they're using it as a liaison to get into the gospel. Open doors. We have no idea what those open doors are going to look like. Yes, pray for open doors. Pray for boldness to preach the gospel clearly and accurately. Phillips Brooks put it this way, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Why, I, uh, doesn't that convict me? Man of little faith. Praying for easier tasks, and yet we ought to be praying for greater power. Yo, we visited with Paul in Ephesians 6 just a moment ago. He said in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, with this in view, be on the alert, with all perseverance and petition for the saints. Are you persevering in prayer or do you pray once or twice and give up? He says, and pray on my behalf, so Paul's asking more for intercession, that utterance might be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. You know, his next words might get him to the slammer. Because this is what I'm an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Many times we can be very pragmatic. And we are praying for the cushy life and the easy way. It's amazing. You know, this context of these verses are spiritual warfare. It's putting on the armor of God. That's why we can't skip over it. Where is Paul when he's writing this? He's in a prison in Rome, and he's chained. What's it he asking the saints at Ephesus to do for him? Pray for boldness to share the gospel. Where's he at? Prison. It could refer to boldness in the proclamation in prison, whoever, uh, whatever guard he gets shackled to. Or boldness when his court appearance comes that he wouldn't shrink back because there's a way that you can answer matters and not get in the hot water and not, also not be faithful to the truth. What he's praying is please pray I don't wimp out in sharing the gospel. Just because my circumstances aren't ideal in my eyes, this is what God's sovereign wisdom brought about. Please pray I'd seize this opportunity to be bold in sharing the gospel wherever I am. It's an amazing first prayer request. Paul's an evangelistic giant. And he asks what to us wouldn't be the common thing. You're asking these young believers. That's the point. Paul's like you and I. He's like all of our missionaries. Sharing the gospel was not easy and it never has been easy. It's easy to chicken out. It's easy to say enough without going through the hard issues and being faithful. But we need to leave the results with God and focus on faithfulness. It's always easy to be quiet, to say nothing, than to confront sinners with their sinfulness and the truth of the gospel. You ever ask yourself the question, as we memorize Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the very power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why did Paul write that? Maybe, could it be that he himself at one point or at other times had been ashamed of it? I 
Because Jesus said we'd be hated, we'd be insulted, and even persecuted for proclaiming this message. You know, if things go along status quo for too long, we maybe ought to ask ourselves, where's the unfaithfulness been? Because I'm not getting enough flack for this. It's not that we're eager to go to prison or to offend people, but the gospel is offensive. It divides the truth from error. Why was John the Baptist so brutally decapitated by Herod? It's because he dared confront him on his sin of adultery, and he eventually lost his head for it. He could have easily have saved his neck just by remaining quiet, but he didn't. And so Paul, this superior believer, this mature apostle, asked this fledgling church, pray for us. Pray to be faithful. Pray that I, I'd have power, that there'd be boldness. It's very easy to chicken out. You know, our missionaries, they can find a thousand worthy things to do in their days besides going out and sharing the gospel with sinners. You know, there's study, there's language acquisition, there's church work, there's administration, papers to shuffle, meet and disciple Christians, socialize, go to prayer meetings, counsel people, marry people, bury people work on the church budget, take time to live, deal with the legal matters, and the list goes on and on. And those are good things. Those are rightful things. Worthy things to do, but they can also be used as excuses to wimp out from the challenge of boldly proclaiming the gospel with their mouths. That's why Paul asked for boldness. Friends, we need prayer helpers. You don't overlook a practical and invaluable aspect of the gift of prayer that God's given believers. One has said it's strange that missionaries don't seem to be what they used to be, bemoaned this speaker. Take William Carey, for instance. He changed the history of India. We don't have missionaries like that today. The father of modern mission. The speaker then spoke of Carey's sister who lay paralyzed in bed for 50 years and couldn't even articulate her words most of the time. She'd get her tongue all tied. Propped up in bed, she wrote lengthy letters of encouragement to her brother William Carey and prayed constantly for him. Draw back the curtain to the success of these men who God has gratefully used. If we don't have missionaries like William Carey today, Maybe it's because they don't have prayer helpers like Carrie's sister. Paul didn't see himself as the greatest gift to Christendom. And he begged these fledgling believers at Thessalonica, I need your prayer support. Pray for power. Second of all, pray for protection. If intentional about proclaiming the gospel with your mouth and power, he would be attacked by all the combined forces of Satan, hell, and his legions of demonic hosts. Satan and his cohorts hate the gospel, and they hate everyone that promote the gospel. You've got a bullseye on your chest. And they replace with deceiving lies and doctrines of demons. You go into 2 Thessalonians again. 2 you know, he said, uh, finally pray for us in verse 1, that... Uh, Word of the Lord would spread rapidly and be glorified just as also it was with you. And that we would be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. That is an understatement of the century right there. Not all have faith. In other words, darned if you do, darned if you don't. Doesn't matter what you say, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Paul constantly faced hostility in his ministry. He asked the brethren to pray for protection so he could proclaim the gospel to more and more people, that nothing would stop him. Who were these people? The term is adipos. Literally, people that are out of place. They are unrighteous men. There's no soft or kind way to put it. Evil as well. Wicked people who are enemies of the gospel. Now I know we need some more of the president's sensitivity training when we talk that way, but it's biblical speech coming from the Apostle Paul. People who wanted to strong arm him into not proclaiming the message. Unbelievers, men who did not have faith, though at times these are people who might look like they have faith. 
those that are religious, they worship with us during worship service, but they are lost. They haven't come all the way to Christ. They may be on the membership roster of the church, some of our own friends, but did not Paul warn the Ephesian elders that those savage wolves that you need to look for, they're not going to be outside of you. They're going to be coming up from your own midst. They're going to look like you and smell like you. They're going to sing the same hymns with you. So there's going to be disloyalty, Acts 20, 20, 29. So Paul is constantly, all we're doing is summarizing his prayer request to follow his model. Over in Romans, 13, Romans 15. Romans 15 and verse number 30. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. So here he is again, strive with me in prayer together. Literally, agonize with me. This is intense praying that he might be delivered from those who are disobedient in Judea. That sounds a bit different from the generic prayers of, hey God, would you bless missionary so-and-so? And we have no idea what's going on in their lives. Whatever. Acts 20. He said that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying, bonds and afflictions await me, so sign up for gospel ministry. Go to the mission field. They'll love you, right? Not necessarily. Was he protected? Well, he wasn't protected from suffering, but from death at that time. What's the point? The point is the gospel proclaimers, they're in constant danger, physical, spiritual, in need of constant prayer. That's where you come in, saints. In Philippians 1.19, Paul is convinced of his deliverance because of the praying saints at Philippi. Isn't that neat? He knows that God's going to deliver him, at least if, if not from the problem, through the problem. Though facing horrible physical assault, stoning, many tribulations, beaten with rods, prison, stretched, Chained, lashes. Just imagine his back and his broken body by the end of his service. Paul knew the real battle was spiritual between Jesus and his arch enemy. And since Satan couldn't get to Jesus and Satan, since Satan's minions couldn't get to him, it falls upon those of us that fill up his afflictions. He is the God of this age. And yet we're all called to snatch people like brands from the burning as we communicate the gospel message. Sounds like a suicide mission. Walking into the lion's cage because Satan hates what we're doing. Our adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, 2 Peter 5.8. And particularly appetizing, on this smorgasbord are pastors and missionaries because the downfall of one of either means the downfall of an entire ministry. Look at the headlines. If he can take out the pastors, if he can take out those missionaries who have carved out a trail and are the only ones proclaiming the good news of Jesus and training other ministers, and he can bring them into disqualifying sin. Attacks by evil men, discouragement, difficult circumstances, sickness like with Job. Tragedy, accidents, death of your spouse, children or parents like missionary friends have done. Lack of fruit, conflict within the team, temptation, sin, depression, out and out persecution, family problems, problem with children that disqualify them, schooling problems where your kids as missionary kids are being ostracized by the locals. Not saying we can attribute all problems to Satan. Because God allows many events to strengthen our resolve and faith and walk with Him. But Satan certainly tries to twist and discourage and make us ineffective. Obstacles don't mean it's of the devil. 
God does a lot of it for our growth. Paul knew this. And he requested prayer that he'd be protected and delivered from evil men. Men whose father, John 8.44, tells us is none other than Satan himself. The old Baptist preacher Spurgeon said, What? Do you say you have nothing to pray for? What? No children unconverted? No friends unsaved? No neighbors who are still in darkness? What? You live in London and not pray for sinners? Where do you live? Is it in some vast wilderness amid some boundless contiguity of shade where rumors of sin and of ignorance has never reached your ear? If our feet are held to planet earth, we are sinners in the midst of sinners desperately need a prayer. Spurgeon was reflecting upon a, a brother at prayer one time. He said, our brother said in his prayer, Lord, help us who cannot preach to pray for the man who does. Have you, dear friend, who cannot preach made a point of praying for the pastor of the church to which you belong? There's a lot of implications to Paul's prayers here. As we pray for our missionaries' power, we pray for their protection, are we also thirdly praying for their purity? Pray for pure and holy living in the midst of sinful and godless nations. Now, I'm not saying that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, which is a, uh, a common view in evangelicalism, but look at Hebrews 13:18. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. The author being honest and transparent, what's he saying? Life is tough out there in the jungle. Temptations are great and I am weak. I could fall into sin at any time. Brethren, pray that God, pray to God that my conscience would never get accustomed to sin and that it would continually react violently at the inevitable sight of sin, that I'd remain holy and pure in the midst of a sinful and perverse generation. Paul knew nothing discredits a ministry more quickly and totally than sin. You could trace his testimony through Acts 20, Acts 23, chapter 24, chapter 25, where he says, I have done no wrong. Paul is not boasting in his pride, but he had an uncondemned conscience that he was not disqualified. He buffeted his body to make it his slave, lest when he preached the same truths to others, he'd be a hypocrite, a castaway. The elder qualifications need to be maintained where these men are blameless, even on the mission field where we can't get at them. They're alone, laboring in the Lord's vineyard, away from home in a different culture and language having less or at times no accountability. They can dry up spiritually and thus be more susceptible to sin. Often live in particularly pagan cultures and are therefore bombarded with enormous amounts of sin daily. They can't turn on on their smartphone, the Bible being read to them, have rich Christian hymns. You know, one missionary friend uh, of mine, John Glass, has been over in France for years. According to him, over there in France, there are four humanistic gods, little g gods. Number one's the god of sex. Every beach, public swimming pool, and park is topless and full nudity on primetime television. That's where he ministers. The god of sex in that country. Number two, God is food. There are 13,000 restaurants in Paris alone. This was years ago that he told me this. Number three, God is vacation. Five weeks vacation by law. And fourth, little g, God is prideful intellectualism. Dear friends, pray for their power. Pray for their protection. Pray for their purity. We are one disqualifying sin away from a wreck and carnage in ministries. Fourthly, pray for pauses. You say, okay, you got desperate for your peas in the liberation, didn't you? You know, there's an old secular proverb that said, you'll break the bow if you keep it continually bent. In Romans 15, verses 30 to 30, 
2, he talks, Paul talks about finding a refreshing visit in your company. Philemon 22, lodging. Did you ever picture Paul as in need of a vacation? Paul's exhausted. When you expend yourself at boldly reaching the lost, at being incessantly battered by the enemy, striving to live a holy life, you get tired. You get real tired, especially in a foreign culture. In fact, you get exhausted. Here, Paul gives us a glimpse. Those are just two passages I gave you, glimpses into his heart. He's longing to come home and to be refreshed. Let's just pause and park for a second, because I know my time is gone. This is another reason why I think a lot of churches need to redo their missions giving. You know, instead of boasting about this big, well, it used to be a big uh, missionary board where you'd pack missionaries up and you'd give them, give them your token $20, $40, $50 $50 support a month. And look at how many missionaries we support. We should humble ourselves and realize that we ought to support less at greater amounts. And some friends that just came home from England, this is their first um, time home, uh, time on furlough in over eight years. And when you come home, you've got to run around to all these churches that barely support you so that you don't lose any of your support. Reporting to dozens of churches, putting tens of thousands of miles on, works against itself. You know, I wish we had time to, maybe you'd mark down your bullets in Acts 14, 27, and 28. It, was, it pictures this refreshing, that being out of conflict and battle and being recharged is the importance. This is precisely where the battle lies with a lot of missionaries. Many don't know how to stop and rest. They don't know how to take time off. They would be what the world calls a workaholic. Not all, but many. There's a lot of pressure on them to produce, to show the church a good return on their investment. Those supported by the churches and individuals sometimes feel that pressure to produce and get results, to send that prayer letter out with results so that they'll, um, they don't stop. Sooner or later, they crack. So some take no days off. They hardly take vacations, and some hardly take furloughs. That ought not to be so for our heroes in the faith that help us be faithful, get the gospel to the nations. Well, the greatest missionary penned in Scripture, Apostle Paul, openly admitted his need to be prayed for. Missionary Paul, by divine inspiration, places before us a prayer list that we just summarized in various texts that will help us cultivate our love for them, increase their effectiveness on the field, as well as accrue fruit to our account as we partner with them in gospel enterprise. Pray for power, painstaking boldness in proclaiming the gospel message with their mouths. Dear friends, pray for protection. Pray for protection from Satan and his human and celestial agents that are working his wares. Pray for purity and holy living in the midst of sinful and godless nations, and pray for pauses. Pray that they would know how to stop and recuperate, that they might continue for decades should Jesus tarry. You may have asked the question before, how can I be involved in ministry who cannot go and yet have been called to support? And we understand missionary support many times has been financial. But what about the support of encouragement and involvement in their lives so that they can send us a text and an email, how that we're supporting them in prayer. Because when you pray for others, we become partners with God in His work of salvation, His work of healing, spiritually speaking, comfort, justice. God can accomplish those things without us. But in His plan, He gives you and I the privilege of being involved with Him through prayer. When we intercede, for a grandson in trouble, a mother having surgery, a neighbor who needs Christ, or a pastor who needs strength, we're asking God to provide for that person what we cannot provide. We're acting as go-betweens, asking God to direct His power in a specific direction as we intercede. You know, in His classic book, 
titled Prayer, Olin Halsby described how it works. He says, quote, This power is so rich and so mobile that all we have to do when we pray is point to the person or thing to which we desire to have God's power applied, and he, the Lord of this power, will direct the necessary power to the desired place, unquote. Now, don't take Halsby's quote and run too far with it. It assumes, of course, that we're praying according to God's will, 1 John 5, 7, 5, 14. Prayer is not this magic wand for satisfying our wishes. It's an opportunity, though, to work, to labor with the Lord as he accomplishes his purpose through his faithful people. You know, James tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So let's humbly and earnestly pray for one another and our partners in ministry. Would you pray with me? God, we understand that with all Scripture revelation in so many passages, that the most powerful position on earth is kneeling before the Lord of the universe. That the humble believer on his knees is taller than a philosopher on his tippy toes because we're begging you to do that which only you can do. God, thank you for calling us to yourself, for setting your love upon us, to give us the privilege of ministry, of evangelism,